It's so good to be here. Um, it's probably been at least three weeks since I've even been to a service, so words can't describe how much I miss you guys, how much I miss this and normal life. Anyone say amen? <laughs> yes. We all miss that, right? Yeah, what's normal? The new normal. Oh, shut up. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> um, so we, we've been doing a series for, it's probably been over a month, I'm not sure, because I've missed several services, but... Um, what Jesus says about things, right? Um, and so the topic today, and I picked this one, as ironic as this might sound, was what does Jesus say about suffering? And everyone's like, woohoo! <laughs> now, Mark Miller's not here, but he would say woohoo, because whenever he's like, Jess, I hate asking you advice, because whenever I ask you advice, you're like, you gotta die, Mark. You gotta die to yourself. And he's like, oh gosh, don't ask Jess. <laughs> So, of course, I'm going to pick suffering as the topic I want to talk about today. But God's done so much in my life through this topic and through what I've walked through in the last probably 10 years that I just, I think it's best when people speak on things that they've walked through, right? Right? We can all preach a message. We can all study Greek words, and we can preach something, and it sounds good, and it's truth. But there's a truth here, and then there's a truth here. Okay? And so God wants us to speak and to share out of the truth here, not just here. Um, so I hope that I can do that today. Um, before I start, I just want to start with a little story. Um, I know a lot of people, we go way back here. You know, I started attending the church when I was a teenager. Um, so the church has almost been 40 years, New Testament's been here. So when I was a teenager, I was not a good Christian girl. <laughs> so hard to believe. Now, I wasn't into drugs or drinking so much, but I had this horrible problem. If someone dared me to do something, anything, this is a horrible problem, I would do it. You know, like the game Truth or Dare? Oh my gosh, it was, it was horrible. And so it started out when I was probably 13, you know, and my friends, we'd go to the mall because it used to be cool to go to the mall and hang out, right? St. Lawrence Mall, that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, so we'd go to the mall and they'd be like, hey, Jess, look here, I see a piece of gum on the ground, chewed gum. I dare you to eat it. And I'd be like, oh, mm. God, I dare you. You won't do it, will you? And I'm like, nah. So I'd stick it in my mouth, you know. It's really stupid. Listen, if you have a, a, a weak stomach, you're not going to like this story I'm about to tell you. All right, just warning you right now. Go to the bathroom for about five minutes. Okay. So, but then people had to keep upping the ante because they were like, hey, yeah, there's this new girl. She goes to our church. She'll do anything you dare to do. So stupid. Anybody, any youth in here, if that's you, just stop. It will save you so much heartache down the road in your life. Just don't do it, okay? Let the pride die. Okay, so then it went on to just weird things like, I'm trying to think of an example. Oh, okay, so we were at camp. The first camp I ever went to was a Christian camp, and a whole bunch of us got on one of, one of the buses, not the one we have now, but an old school bus, and we went to a Christian camp with a church in Utica, and they had actually had a game that was called, What Would You Do For Money? Now, this is crazy because this is the spiritual things that we do with your youth, right? <laughs> so they had $5. Now, $5 when you're 14 years old is like back in the 90s. That's a lot of money. I mean, I could buy, I, like, literally toys. That's hard to believe nowadays, but not from the dollar store even. <laughs> so they had offered $5, and they said, who, who wants to volunteer? Now, they're not telling you what you have to do. They're just telling you, we're going to dare you to do something. Now, these are the youth pastors, mind you. This is not kids anymore. So I'm just, just clarifying that. So we're going to give $5 to the first volunteer. So everybody's like, Jessica, Jessica, Jessica. So I'm like, yeah, me, me, me. So they call me up, and I'm like, okay, what do I got to do? And they, bring, oh, they open up this little container, like a Tupperware container. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen these before. Mix a bunch of weird foods in a Tupperware container, throw some ketchup on top, and you eat it. I can do that. <laughs> well, they open it up, and it's dirt. And I'm like, dirt? I don't want to eat dirt. But then I see that there's worms moving around in the dirt, and I'm like, what? And then I'm like, I have to eat worms? And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Someone comes from the other side of, you know, we're outside. We're all gathered around this area at camp. And they've got a loaf of bread. And I'm like, what? And so they're like, you're going to eat a double-decker live worm sandwich. And I'm like, wait a second. 
So I had to eat two bites of a double decker live worm sandwich because the first one they claimed I didn't get the worm. And I I bit the worm, okay? It was still moving in my mouth and crunching in my teeth. Okay, because worms eat dirt, right? So uh, yeah. So there was that one. But that's not even the worst. So after that point, they had to up the ante once again. So this was months later, and it was a tradition at, at youth. We would go to Cross Current. The building used to be downtown. And after Cross Current, we would walk. A lot of teenagers would walk to Pizza Hut. Now, Pizza Hut used to be down on the corner of Main Street. You guys all remember that. So we're at Pizza Hut, and everybody's saying, oh, yeah, remember when Jessica ate that worm sandwich? Oh, ugh, ugh. You know, I don't know why I had friends after that, honestly. <laughs> they loved Jesus, so they loved me. I don't know why. And they were like, oh, we got to think of something worse than that. And I'm like, no, no, I'm good. And they're like, yes, yes, let's, let's dare her to drink whatever we put in this Pizza Hut Pepsi cup. And I'm just like, oh. So, of course, I'm like, fine, whatever. It's, what are you going to do, mix Coke with orange soda? Woo! <laughs> like, whatever, sure, okay, go for it. So they all kind of conspire together. And next thing I know, I see people hawking loogies into a Pepsi cup, empty cup. That's not just like, let's put it in with the Pepsi or the water and dilute it. Oh, no, let's, let's multiple people. Let's, let's get like, this is like COVID not safe, okay? <laughs> We're, we're going to pass it around a table, and whoever feels the urge to hock a loogie into this cup, we're going to then give it to Jessica because she loves dares. Oh, my gosh. So I'm staring at this cup. I'm swirling it around, and I'm thinking, this has gone too far. But there was something in me no matter what. Somebody dared me to do something. I had to do it. And I just kept thinking, how am I even going to swallow this? Because it's really thick, okay? <laughs> so next thing I know, I went like this, and I downed it. And I can't even describe to you, may you never have to experience it. You never will, because no one is as stupid as me, okay? So I tell you this crazy story because there's something about when I was holding that cup and I was staring in there, and everything in me thought, I do not want to drink this. Do you realize that the Bible says, the Bible actually talks about cups a lot. You know the verses in the Bible where it says, he set a table before me in the presence of my enemy, right? So God has set this table before us, and he offers different cups. So if you guys have your paper, you don't have to take notes, but I would highly recommend if you want to remember um, I think it was Adam Avery always used to say, the pen remembers what the brain forgets. And I forget everything. So take notes for me. No, just kidding. Take notes for yourself. Um, so this is the first point. If you're taking notes, I just want you to write. At the king's table, several, there's several cups to drink from. So just write that down. At the king's table, there's several cups to drink from. Now, we all know, you know, we don't live in this world. We live for the kingdom of God, right, as Justin was talking about. So the king here is God. So in the Bible, whenever you see the word cup, especially in the New Testament, it's talking about our portion or our lot. Um, you see it many times and in many different references. The Greek word for it actually even has the image of, you know, like a goblet, like you guys know what I'm talking about? You know, like if uh, royalty, you have this beautiful goblet. Um, well, it actually even goes back to the tradition where the idea of a cupbearer. So way back, um, you know, in times where there were kings and there was a position called a cupbearer, Nehemiah was actually somebody that served the king in this way. And what they did was, it's a horrible job, not as bad as the loogies, but pretty bad. <laughs> what, they got to be in the presence of the king, so they were treated like royalty in one sense, but the bad part was, Anything the king was to drink, the cupbearer had to drink first. And it was ordered to make sure, because people were always trying to kill or poison the king, the cupbearer had to drink the cup and make sure, oh, look, you know, they'd wait five minutes. Oh, he didn't die. He's not foaming at the mouth. Good, okay. <laughs> Here you go, king. So that's kind of where that word cup comes from. But whenever you hear the word drinking of the cup or the phrase, it actually means accepting what the king has served you. 
okay? So you, you, we see that um, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. So the first reference I want to look at is Psalm 16.5. You don't have to turn there in your Bible. Um, this is a Psalm of David. And he said, O Lord, you are my portion and my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. Um, so there's a cup that God's offering to us of our inheritance, right? Do you realize that, that God has an inheritance for you? You know how we were talking about being adopted into the family of God? Well, when you're adopted to a family, you get a portion of their inheritance, right? It's like my son, Isaac. He says to me, this was probably, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. He's got his whole life planned out, literally. He knows who he's marrying, how many kids he's having. And he's apparently living in the house we're living now on the river. And I, but I did, I said to him, I said, buddy, you can have this house when you get older because everything I have is yours. And that's what God says to us. Everything I have is yours. So there's this cup of inheritance that he's offering us. And we're all like, yeah, I'll have that. Give me that. Pass the cup. Oh, yeah. You know, and we're, we'll drink from that cup. So there's another cup, Psalms 116, verse 13. And the psalmist says, I will take up your cup of salvation. So does that sound good? Does anybody want a cup of salvation to be saved from their sin and live forever in heaven? No, yes. One, Josh. Josh does. Only Josh. Oh, oh man, we're in trouble. <laughs> um, right? That sounds great, right? He's saved us. He's bought us with a price. When Jesus died on the cross, we know that that is salvation. If we choose to partake of it, that's, that's the image of a cup, right? This is the thing. Have you ever tried to make anyone drink something? Now, if you've ever had kids... You probably have. Like when they have to take that liquid medicine, it tastes like bubble gum. You're lying. <laughs> kind of like bubble gum. You know, you're trying to force that little cup and it spears all down their face. And maybe this is only me. Has any other parent ever tried to force their kids to drink medicine? Okay, good. I feel a little bit better about my abuse. <laughs> um, but you can't really make someone drink a cup, can you? So just like salvation, we have to choose it, right? It's a free gift that's offered to all of us, but there's an act of choice, right? We have to pick it up and drink it and say, okay, Jesus, I, I want that salvation. I want the price you paid on the cross for me, right? Okay, so we're all like, yeah, pass the cup of inheritance. I'll take that. Give me some cup of salvation, sure. And then Jesus pushes another cup over, and she's like, the cup of suffering. And we're all like, oh, nah, never mind, pass. I'm, I'm so full. All that others, I'm just full pass, you know, trying to be a nice, nice guest if you're at a host house, never mind. But don't we do this, right? We're like, give me all the good stuff, Jesus. But then why are you talking about this cup of suffering? Because we're talking about what Jesus says about suffering. And every time I looked up the word in the gospels, when Jesus talked about suffering, every time he said the cup of suffering, every time, and I'm like, what's up with this cup thing? But it's because there's some kind of willful choice. Now, who in the world is willfully choosing to suffer? And that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about. Um, so point number two, you can write down those different cups. There's a cup of inheritance, cup of salvation, cup of suffering. Um, point number two. So this is what I want to talk about for a minute. Do you guys realize there's actually two different types of suffering? So write that. Point number two. There's two different types of suffering. So there's this, let me show, illustrate. This is the first type of suffering. I'm walking along. I'm minding my own business. La, 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 la. All of a sudden, something horribly bad happens. Out of nowhere. Someone I know gets sick. My kids have autism. I get in a car accident. COVID even. Um, you could fill in the blank. All of a sudden, my husband runs off and I have to, go through a long process of divorce. That, so that type of suffering is when hard things happen to me. So you can write that. So two types of suffering. Hard things happen to us. Now, we, nobody is exempt from this, right? It doesn't matter if you're Christian or if you're not Christian. It doesn't matter if you serve God so faithfully. And this is where we get mad at God because we're like, man, have you seen? I've been trying to follow you all these years, and then you let this bad thing happen to me. It's easy to get hard and bitter at God. But it, it, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. He never promised that we would be exempt from suffering, right? The word that is used in the Greek 
for this type of suffering. It's not even suffering. They usually use the word trials and tribulations, okay? That doesn't sound fun either, does it? But all that really means, it's like, you remember how Paul says, um, we were pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed? That's that word. It's called, um, the, the Greek translation is hard pressed. It's like life is pressing in on every side. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's you have a sickness in your body um, that, you know, you're still believing God wants to heal, but you're trying to live every day with it. Um, it could be so many different things. It could be relational strains, but it is something every one of us will experience. It will look different in every life, but I tell you what, you cannot escape it. It's part of this fallen world. Now, but I want to clarify, and I hope everybody knows this, but this isn't from God. That's the other thing I want to clarify, because that can just sound like, oh, this is sounding really weird. You're trying to tell me that God's causing all these horrible things to happen to me. No, no, no. We have a real enemy, and we live in a fallen world, and he is going to do things to try to attack us, do things to drag us down. He's going to cause sickness in our body, or he's going to cause relational tensions in our family. But the thing is this, God loves to redeem and use everything that the enemy throws at us, right? So that's the first type of suffering. Now, the second type of suffering is a little different. Um, the second type is I willfully choose taking, drinking from a cup. Hard things. Now, not, not just for the sake of hard things. For the sake of the kingdom. Okay? Number two. I willfully choose hard things for the sake of the kingdom. Now, when you see somebody do this, usually the response is, they're crazy. Even Christians. Excuse me, something's, why would you choose blah, blah, blah? Um, but there's something in us, I believe in our spirit, when God is awake in our spirit, that he will call us to something hard, maybe more than one thing, maybe multiple things. And that's what we talk about the cup of suffering. So, um, the first time we see this, if you guys want to open your Bibles, is Matthew chapter 20, verse, starting at verse 20. Okay. So this is when Jesus... This is when Jesus is with, um, basically with his disciples, and I think Greg might have read this story not too long ago. So the mother, I love it that, that it's the mother, of James and John, so two of his disciples, comes to Jesus, all respectfully, bows down, oh, teacher, teacher, you know, and says, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully and asked for a favor. What is your request, he asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on the right and one on the left. Moms always think their kids are the best, don't they? But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the cup of suffering I'm about to drink? And I love this. Oh, yes, they replied. Oh, gosh, we are able. Like James and John, wow, you have no idea what you're saying. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup. And he always calls it a bitter cup. I'm like, oh, you love that term too. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. I just want to read a little bit further. When the 10 other disciples heard that James and John had asked, they were indignant. So they're mad. They're like, what? Oh, how dare they ask that? But Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority with those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. I just love that verse. So this is my next point. The day you stop being willing to pay the cost for the kingdom is the day you stop leading. I'll say that again. 
The day you stop being willing to pay a cost for the kingdom of God is the day you stop leading. I don't care what title you have or if you don't ever have a title. You lead every day of your life. I can't lead somewhere, someone, someone, a place I haven't already been. So as Christians and as people that are called to be a light to the world, we have to go places nobody else is going. We have to be willing to do things that nobody else is doing, not for the sake of just doing something hard, but because it is what reveals the glory of God to the world. They say to themselves, you're crazy. There's no person in their right mind that would do such and such. Let me give you a couple examples because I think sometimes it's easy to be like, yeah, I agree, but I don't understand how that comes to practical life. Now, people aren't going to like this, but I'm going to mention people, some people in this room, But I want you to see that there is a cost. And God is so glorified when we're willing to take a sip of that cup for him. One of my examples, Jason Sweet. I don't know if he's in here. He's probably hoping he's not. But I don't know how many guys realize, but Jason Sweet had an HR job at Canton Potsdam Hospital that paid a lot of money. Double, over double what he makes at the church now. But he felt like he was supposed to work here. And he had no promise of even maybe being a pastor or doing any kind of ministry or ever being able to share his heart from the pulpit. But he left his six-figure job. And he came to work here with no guarantee of anything. No good retirement, no nothing. And I tell you what... There's nothing more beautiful than a life laid down for the kingdom. There's nothing. Hannah, Jenna, and Kayla Kesner spent almost two years, two years when they were in the prime of their life where they should be going to college and having fun with their friends and hanging out with cute boys. They gave it all up, and they spent two years in Africa. Most people didn't even know they were there, except us in the church. Most people have no idea the heartache and the pain they chose. These weren't their kids. They chose to experience. They put themselves, who does that? People that want to look just like Jesus. I want to look like Jesus. Because when we look like Jesus, he gets glorified. Because in our weakness, he is strong. I'm telling you, there's nothing more beautiful to Jesus than a life laid down. We drink up every other cup he has to give us. But when it comes to this one, we're all like, oh, I'm out. That one's too hard. But it's literally the most fulfilling, too. But there's other examples. It doesn't have to look like you're being a missionary overseas or you're working for a church. It could be my mother-in-law and father-in-law who have raised their child or their grandson almost from birth because of circumstances in their life. They didn't have to do that. They chose to lay their life down. And you don't really get any credit for it. Most people just think you're weird. But that's not what we're looking at. We're not looking at what people think now. We're looking at an eternal glory, right? So I lost my spot because I went on a tangent. But there's just, there's so many more examples I could tell you of people in this church. But that is the second type of suffering. So the day you stop paying the cost is the day you stop leading. Now, this can't be judged by any man, just so you guys know. I can't look at somebody's life and say, hmm, They should have done that. Mm, They weren't paying the cost. No, no, no. This is only judged by you and God. And I think if we are honest in this room, a lot of times we know deep in our hearts if God's calling us to do something. And we know when we walk away from it, right? So this isn't anything that can be judged on the outside. Um, So let's look at the second time that Jesus talks about a cup. So he's got this cup analogy in his mind. So the first time he says to James and John, you willing to drink this bitter cup? Yeah, you will. And they did, actually. So James was the first apostle that was martyred. 
So he was literally the first one that lost his life because of the gospel. And John, they believe, you know, lived to be over 100 years old. And I always picture John. Have you guys heard that the Apostle John was exiled to the um, Isle of Patmos? I don't know why, but in my mind, I pictured it like a tropical island. Or like, I don't know, like Tom Hanks and like the, <laughs> you know, uh, in that movie. Pat Castaway, right, with the volleyball, who's talking to the volleyball and having images about, like, the end of the world and talking to Jesus all day long. It was not like that. The more I started to read about it, I was like, wow, this is a really bad picture in my head. I just thought he was got to hang out on this island, like, all by himself. Um, but it was an island for criminals, first of all. And it wasn't an island like we think of, like, sand and palm trees. It was, like, super rocky and barren, like, a horrible Lo- location. And then there's all these other criminals. So it was more like the Hunger Games than it was like Tom Hanks, you know, even though Tom Hanks goes crazy on that one. But um, so it was like crazy. And they actually worked, they had um, mining. These criminals worked in the mines and they were like forced, like slavery and stuff. So John's not living it up on this island. Like he suffered a lot. And then there was even an account that they believe that John, this is crazy, at one point before he was exiled, was boiled in a vat of oil. Sign me up. But he lived miraculously. Somehow he lived and didn't die. So they really did drink from a, a cup of suffering. Um, so the second time, sorry, I was showing you that Jesus talks about a cup. And I'm actually not going to turn there because we're going to do communion in a little bit. So we'll turn there again. But it's Matthew 26, 27 through 29. So this is, they're gathered at a table again. This is Passover, right? And he's with his 12 disciples, Jesus is. And he knows he's going to die soon. So he gathers with them at this table, you know, in the presence of his enemy. Because who is his enemy at the table? With the 12. Anybody know? Judas, because he was going to betray him, right? He already knew that Judas was going to betray him. So he gathered at this table, and he's trying to tell them, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to lay down my life. I'm going to die. And they're not still really getting it. And he takes this bread, and he says, break it just like my body. And I have this cup of wine, and this is my blood. It's going to be poured out for you. But what's interesting is when he offers them the cup, he doesn't say, take this wine and drink it. Right? We've done communion a million times. What do we say when we say, take this? Ah, He's still on the cup thing. Because it's so much more than, yes, they're choosing It's a cup of salvation, right? We're choosing to take the blood of Jesus and believing that he's going to cover our sins, the blood that he shed for us. But there's something in this, this, it's a choice, right? And when we do communion now, we all have the little cups and they're individual. We don't share, right? But back then and for Passover, there was one cup. All it was was the one cup that Jesus had. And every one of them had to choose to drink from it. So they weren't all just drinking their own. So they were choosing to drink from the king's cup. Um, And in a way, it was a willingness, them showing a willingness to share similar trials that Jesus did. And there's another Hebrew reference that this comes from too. So when, in the Hebrew culture, when a man and woman are going to get married and they're betrothed, they would sit down at a table, they would have a meal, and the man would have a cup you know, and it probably had wine in it, and he would take a drink from the cup, and he would pass it to his soon-to-be future wife, and it was really a test. It was all symbolic. If she drank from that cup, she was saying, I agree to marry you. I'm agreeing, you know, in this covenant. I'm, I'm, I'm coming under this covenant relationship. I want to be in a marriage covenant with you. If they didn't drink it, they were refusing the marriage, and that was this symbolic act. I don't want to know what happened after that. But, um, but so there's so much symbolism in the whole idea of the cup, and even in the Passover. Um, you know, we think about the marriage vows, right? For better or worse, for sickness and in health, till death do us part. And we think about that between a person. But do you ever think about it this way? Because it says we are married. There's going to be a giant wedding where we're married to the lamb. And that just means to Jesus. Like we are his bride. And there's a part of us that has to say for better or worse. In sickness and health. 
till death do us part. I'm not scared of COVID because he's going to be with me no matter what. Even if someone passed over to the other side, I'm not scared of what's happening on election day. Why? Because he's going to be with me no matter what, for better or worse, in sickness and health, till death do us part. There is such, God just is so wants us to go into a deeper relationship with him. And it doesn't mean you're never afraid. And it doesn't mean things don't ever get rocky and shaky in your life. But you always come back. You know, I always say something like, I have nowhere else to go, God. No matter how hard my life gets, no matter what happens in this crazy world, I got nowhere else to go. I know you too well. I, I, what would I do with myself? It's just you can't run when you know him that intimately. Um, so the third time, you guys can look this up if you want, that Jesus talks about a cup of suffering is Luke twenty two forty two. 42. Okay, so this is, so the Passover's happened, they drink from the cup, and, you know, Jesus is realizing his time is short, that they're going to come and arrest him. So these Roman soldiers show up to come to arrest him, and in verse, oh, sorry, am I at the right one? 22, 42. Sorry, I'm going, I'm skipping ahead. So before that happens, before they come to arrest him, Jesus is praying in the garden, right? So verse 41, it says, He walked away about a stone's throw. This is from the disciples. This is Jesus. And he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Okay, then I just want to stop for a second. Jesus did the pass move. It's okay. Don't, I, I hope I don't feel like I'm beating you guys up. Because anybody that's been like, oh, pass, that's a little bit too much for me, God. I don't want a drink of that. Jesus is literally asking his father, can we pass on this one? It's a part of, it's, it's human nature. It got, it, our flesh does not want to suffer. There's no part of us. And so do not beat yourself up right now if you feel like you've passed on times when God's calling you something hard. Jesus wanted to. But what does he say next? This is what I love. Okay, so Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. He was in so much distress that he was literally sweating blood, which is a real thing. It's actually happened to other people before. It's been documented medically. It's not some, like, you know, painting on a wall and you see drops of blood, you know, he's praying in the garden, like, oh, it's, it's symbolic. No, it really happened. Um, that's how much agony he was going through. But he says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. This is the other thing I think Greg said a couple weeks ago. This is what I love about Jesus. He never asks us to do something that he hasn't already done himself. As a man, too. Not as, oh, up in heaven, I did A, B, or C. I felt everything you felt. I know everything you're thinking. And I even asked my father to pass on that one. (laughs) He's so good like that, right? Um, So let's go real quick. I want to show you the fourth time that we see Jesus talk about the cup of cup of suffering. It's John 18, 11. So this is the part I was talking about where the soldiers, Roman sh- soldiers sh- show up. They're about ready to arrest Jesus. And of course, his disciples are like, oh, we're going we're gonna to fight for you. We're going to defend you. We're not going to let them take you. And, you know, so it says, verse 11. Then, or sorry, start at verse 10. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Melchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? So Peter literally slices off his ear. I like Peter. He's so impulsive. (laughs) He's like my kids. (laughs) Slices off his ear and, and Jesus says, what are you doing? What are you doing? Am I not willing to drink from this cup of suffering that the Father has offered me? Um, So this is point number four. God's will is rarely easy, but it's always good. 
Can you imagine if Jesus didn't let them arrest him? Now, Jesus had all power and authority. He could just call a whole bunch of angels, sweep him up into heaven. You know, even though he emptied himself and became a man, at any moment he could just say, forget this, I'm out of here. Or when he went before, you know, and he stood trial and they said, you're blaspheming, you say you're the son of God, we don't believe it, prove it to us. He could have just done some crazy miracle, right? He could have just been like, uh, who's, you know, sick right now? Or, you know, give me some water and wine, I'll turn it to wine. You know, he could have done anything. He did nothing. They said he, like, a slant, like a sheep before the slaughter, he said nothing. That's crazy to me because he knew he had to drink from this cup. Imagine if he did not make those choices. But what does Jesus say to us? Whoever wants to follow me must what? Deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow. I like the what would Jesus do bracelets, but not that part. Right? That was a big thing when I was a kid. Everybody had those. Like, even people, I'm like, are you Christian? You know, it was just cool to have a what would Jesus do bracelet. But I was like, we all want to be nice people. We would all love for Jesus to move through us and heal people and deliver people and speak kind words to people. But I don't like that part over there, the, the picking up a cross. No, thank you. <laughs> I'll pass right? But man, the truth is, and I know it's true of everybody in here, your heart's cry is to look like Jesus. It's not easy, but it's always good. Always. So point five, this is Jesus never called us to fight for our rights but to surrender to the Father's will. This is a hard one. Jesus never called us to fight for our rights, but to surrender to the Father's will. Now that's hard for Americans to hear. Does that mean I think we shouldn't have a right to vote or we shouldn't fight for, you know, black rights or all of these things? I'm not saying that. Please hear what I'm saying. But as a culture... We've been on the defense. We are always fighting for our rights. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, he wants us to, sur the opposite, the surrender our will to the Father. Um, so I want to read you guys one more verse. Now, this isn't Jesus, but this is about suffering because this is a hard message. But I want to to leave you with really, really, really good news. Romans 8, verse 15 through 23. Okay, Romans 8, verse 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to, to affirm we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. And then skip to go down to the next um, verse 18. Yet yeah, what we suffer now is nothing. What we suffer now is nothing. Nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all of creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day that it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have this Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. I really like that, right? Anybody feel like the world is in some labor pains right now? Right? But nothing compares, the suffering cannot compare to the future glory. So this is the last point I have for you. Number six, God doesn't promise, this is an important one, a future outcome. 
but he promises a future glory. This is where we get hung up, because I, and I've gotten hung up here. I do something hard that God tells me to do, like adopt two kids. But then things don't work out as nice and pretty and neat in my family as I thought they were. So then part of me gets a little bit mad at God because I said yes. And now things are hard. And now I'm not sure I can trust you. So the next time you ask me to drink this cup, I'm going to do mm, this. I'm still going to follow you. I'll still love you. I mean, I'll kind of follow you except that cross part. I'll still go to heaven. But mm, keep that cup away from me because the last time I did that, it didn't work out. The outcome wasn't what I thought it would be. Now, he doesn't promise a future outcome. He promises a future glory. Now, that's hard to understand, right? Because is that in heaven? What does that look like? But there's a trust and a faith aspect to that. I want to share a quick story, and then we're going to do communion. If the people that are, hand, are they handing out the elements, or how is that working? Okay, and if the worship team wants to come up. So we're going to partake of communion in a minute. But I want to tell you guys a quick story. So when my son Jeremiah was five, we were driving to Lake George. We are going on vacation. And we're in the car, and you know, when it's a long drive, sometimes your kids get tired, or I get tired, and I'm driving, and they doze off. Um, so Jeremiah falls asleep for about an hour. Well, he comes to, and he wakes up, and he says, Mom, are we, are we at Lake George yet? And I said, no, buddy, we're not there yet. You know, a couple more hours. And he said, I just had the weirdest dream, Mom. And I said, he's five. You know, it's probably clowns, you know, like like coming to get him. <laughs> I don't know. And I was like, really, buddy? What, what dream was it? He goes, I had a dream our whole family was in heaven. I'm like, oh, maybe this was a God dream, you know. So he's telling me, like, oh, it's so nice. And he was like, yeah, we were all there. You know, Mara and, and I don't, I think Isaac was around. Isaac and, and, and you and, and even Adam. Now, Adam was, we had a, a young adult that lived with us for a couple years. He was kind of like a spiritual son to us. He said, even Adam was there, Mom. He was in heaven with our whole family. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is a God dream. Do we hand them out? Sorry, I'm interrupting my story. Do you guys hand them out now? You guys can just hand them out now while I'm talking. Is that okay? Is that the way it works? Okay. Sorry, I'm not used to the new protocol with communion. So anyway, he's like, yeah, so our whole family was there, and even Adam. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, this is such a cute God dream. He goes, except Daddy. Wait a second. Wait, what? Wait, yeah, we were all in heaven. Our whole family was together, but Dad wasn't there. And I'm like, oh, God, this is not a dream. This is a nightmare. I rebuke this in the name of Jesus. And he's like, yeah, it was, it was weird. We were all looking for Daddy, and we were like, why isn't Daddy in heaven? Well, and I'm thinking, why isn't Daddy? He's just driving, and I'm looking at him like, why isn't Daddy in heaven? And he goes, but then we found him. And I said, oh, well, that's good. Where did we find him, honey? Now, he's five. He's a pretty smart boy, but not this smart. He said, Mom, he wasn't in heaven because he was walking with Jesus. I'm like, isn't Jesus in heaven? And he's like, no, Jesus was walking on the earth, and they were walking amongst all these ruins, and they were making plans to build a new earth. It was a God dream. And I say that to you, not to toot my husband's horn, although I bet you he's going to be walking with Jesus, making plans to build the new earth one day. Now, my son's five. He doesn't even know what a new earth is. A lot of people in this room don't, okay? <laughs> um, but God is literally, you know, through that little dream, was showing me, my husband, his desire is to build. To build things literally. To build the church and to build the new earth, what we're doing now, the prices you're paying now, the life you're living now, the things God's calling to you now to do is going to carry into eternity. There is a future glory that nobody can understand. Does that get you into heaven, the cost you pay now? Absolutely not. The only thing that gets you to heaven is the blood of Jesus Christ. But what you'll do when you're there, the responsibility that you'll have, the fact that there is chairs on the left and the right, to God and that Jesus. That doesn't even make sense to me. But it, the Bible says we will rule and reign with him. There is a future glory none of us understand. And this world is passing away. If you haven't started to realize that in 2020, I don't know what's going to wake you up. 
I'm telling you, there's so much more than this. This will be done in the blink of an eye. So if you guys want to stand with me, we're going to partake in communion. I'm just going to read a passage real quick. If anybody needs gluten-free for the communion, there's going to be a basket up here if you happen to need that um, option. So I just want to read real quick 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God. Then he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you guys want to open up your, your bread and we're just going to pray and partake of it. God, we just come before you right now, God, and we just envision ourselves even being there the night that you had Passover with your disciples, knowing you knew, God, the price that you were willing to pay to have us to be with you, Father God. So right now, Jesus, we just partake of the bread and we remember, God, the price you paid for our salvation. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So Jesus, we just come before you right now and we remember the blood that you shed, Father God. We, I just pray you just even envision that cup right now in his hands. And he takes a drink of it, and then he passes it to you. Jesus, we thank you for that price. You can partake of the cup. We thank you for the price that you paid for us, Father God. But I just pray we would see a vision now of not just you partaking of that cup and paying that cost, but that we would see you handing that cup to us and asking, will you drink? Are you willing? And Jesus, we want to say yes, Father God. We want to say yes, Jesus. And it says, so anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord who is unworthy will it, worthy, is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. This is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are drinking and eating God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are sick and some have died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So I just want to, we're just going to finish with this song. And I just want you guys to stay in that place of remembering the cost he paid for you, but seeing that cup before you. And if there is something in your heart, I'm just going to close in prayer and then we're going to sing this last song. Jesus, I just pray you bring to remembrance, or maybe it, it hasn't come yet, but whatever it is that you have asked people in this room to do, a price you have asked them to pay, and maybe you haven't yet, but I pray you prepare their heart for it. Because in order to look like you, sometimes we have to suffer like you did, and we have to choose hard things, Father God. So I just pray, God, that you would just create a soft heart in every one of us to say, Jesus, not your will, not our will, but yours be done. Amen. I hear a whisper in the night. Your loving voice I've heard a thousand times. You call me out upon the waves. To the place where I can only stand by faith That's what I'm made for anyway I hear a whisper in the night 
Your loving voice I've heard a thousand times And calling me out upon the ways And to the place where I can only stand by faith That's what I made for anyway Cause I'll say yes, Lord and I'll say yes, Lord, and I'll say yes, my life is yours. Cause when you call me, I'll come running, and I'll say yes, my life is yours. For there is no one else like you. You want my heart when you rip that veil in two And I hold nothing in these hands And just your promise to be with me to the end And Jesus, lead me on again And I'll say yes, Lord now say yes, Lord, and now say yes, my life is yours. And when you call me, now come running, now say yes, my life is yours. And I'll say yes, Lord, and now say yes. I'll say yes, my life is yours. When you call me, I'll come running. And I'll say yes, my life is yours. And on that day when I go home, See my Jesus seated on his throne. I find a crown upon my head, a thousand jewels for every yes I said, and offer it right back to him. Let's we'll sing that again on that day. Cause on that day when I go And see my Jesus seated on his throne I find a crown upon my head A thousand jewels for every yes I said He'll offer it right back to him. Cause I'll say yes, Lord. And I'll say yes, Lord. And I'll say yes, my life is yours. When you call me, I'll come running. And I'll say I'll say yes, 
relationship that we have with our creator, with Jesus, with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit, it's its just that, it's a relationship. And I, I love, there's another part of this song where we sing where it's not a one-time thing, because, you know, I've had times in my life where I've said yes, where I've taken that suffering, where I've done that thing, but it's not over. <laughs> I still got some yeses ahead. And I love what Jess said, how it's not for, it's not something that can be judged on the outside. It's between you and Jesus. Because I don't know what Jesus is asking of you. I don't know what you need to do. I don't know that opportunity that you have. I don't even know necessarily what gifting you have to give. But you do. It's a very personal, very, very intimate, very relational thing between you and God. I I love this message. I I look forward to to listening to it again and, and just digesting this further because this is this is what it means to follow Jesus to, to say yes to him Jesus we just thank you for what you did the price that you paid God we thank you for the reminder that Jessica brought to us today of, of the opportunity that we have to say yes to you to engage to suffer for your name's sake to suffer so that we can see ultimately glory that transcends our understanding So God, we encourage one another, we strengthen one another, we lift each other up today as we all mutually follow you and the path that you have laid out for each of us today. God, I pray that everybody here, that we learn how to trust our ability to hear you. That we learn to trust our ability to discern what you are saying to us, to discern what the adversary is saying and to to cast that aside, but to discern what you have to say to us, what you are asking us to do. Let us all be confident in our ability to hear you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Have a great week. Thank you very much.